Uh, yeah, because already uh, I was, I has been introduced. I will just move on to uh, my uh, my talk today. So what I'm gonna talk today is about uh, the systematic dissection of the human tissue ecosystem by the iterative single cell data analysis. Uh, can you excuse me? Can you? Okay. Uh, so uh, I always like to start my talk with this uh, pretty image, which is the image that is produced by the AI program DARI. When I ask the question that, uh, can you draw me a picture of the cellular heterogeneity of the human tissue? And this beautiful image not only shows us uh, that uh, our already AI understands that our tissue is composed of the uh, aggregation of the single cells, but it also reminds us that uh, we can define our tissue as a sort of the systematic uh, recurring cell cell interaction programs occurring uh, across the different tissue types. So we now call these recurring cell cell interaction programs as a tissue ecosystem. And the single cell technologies, including single cell transcriptomics and epigenomics or spatial omics, is now we're contributing to uh, enhance our understanding about the component and the architecture of the tissue ecosystem. And in the, in the movement for building this human cell atlas, this is the like, uh, in, international collaborative movement to build a basic databases to, for us to reconstruct, reconstruct this uh, tissue ecosystem. And now you will realize that there are so many data out there. Uh, at least if you just go and search for this human cell atlas data portal, there are enormous amount of information of different cells coming from different organs or different developmental stages or disease status. So now the real challenge that we are facing as a community is how to integrate all this data that has been produced from different maps and then how to turn that into the conceptually harmonized structure about the human tissue ecosystem. And in this review paper from Sarah Teichmann's group, uh, there are four main challenges they have posted uh, to, to address this issue of data integration. First is the data source. So when we uh, try to integrate the public data, all the formats are quite different. Not only in that some upload the R object and the other uh, the others upload the Python object, but some data, they, uh, they have a different like gene nomenclature and some, some gene has been already filtered out that all cause kind of pain you know, for the integration process. And then quality control and individual researchers might know the, the, uh, the problems in their data. But when you're doing this public data analysis, you often don't know and you have to come up with those, some automatic way to detect the bad quality data. And then third part is integration. Because in single cell data, we have a really heterogeneous uh, uh, cells containing in it, contained in each sample. Uh, it is very difficult to know what uh, ex exactly the same cells are across the different uh, samples. So uh, finding the actual, uh, the real counterpart across samples for the certain cell type is still a quite challenging problem. And then finally, the nomenclature, the people are annotating cells, but in different ways. So some people use like, uh, like to put gene names, some others uh, like to put the cell functions in, their, in the cell annotation. So uh, it is quite painful to harmonize those gene, uh, the cell nomenclatures. So those are uh, the most challenging tasks that we need to face uh, for this data integration process. And uh, as a data scientist, we all like to start uh, with the simple, and a uh, nice toy example. So when I thought about this uh, kind of enormous and demanding task of integrating all human uh, single cell data set, I found that maybe if we just focus on certain disease, uh, especially cancer, then this could provide a good toy example. Uh, the reason is like in twofold. Firstly, uh, in cancer, we have an enormous amount of intratumoral heterogeneity, which means we will not only have the mutated epithelial cells, the cancer epithelial cells, but in this cancer tissue, we also find the cancer associated fibroblast and uh, all the other mural or endothelial counterpart and all the immune cells can be found in any cancer type. 
And there are also very interesting organ-wise heterogeneity called intertumor heterogeneity. So uh, depending on which organ or which set of origin uh, the cancer arises from, uh, the cancer tissue architecture is quite different and the way they evolve and the way they react to therapeutics is also different. So just by under trying to integrate all the ca cancer data, cancer single cell transcriptome, I thought that we could understand both the generality and the diversity of the tumor microenvironment. And this can actually give us a quite good example or experience about what we need to do, what kind of problems do we need to solve to fully integrate the human cell atlas. And before we start uh, integrating all the pan-cancer data set, uh, which we or uh, we start with another much smaller toy example, just focusing on single cancer type. And we took pancreatic cancer as an, as, an, as an our example, because pancreatic cancer is known to be uh, very difficult uh, to cure. Uh, it is uh, not easy to diagnose. And also after diagnosis, there are not many therapeutic options for the pancreatic cancer. And the reason for this, main reason for this is that pancreatic cancer is subject to the desmoplastic sort of um, reaction, which means that stroma, the, the dense ECM in each stroma kind of encapsulates the cancer part so that uh, no therapeutics can easily access to the pancreatic cancer tissue. So in this uh, case study, we collaborate with uh, Professor Singmin Bang, uh, Bang from the Yonsei University to actually uh, make a detailed profile of the pancreatic cancer cells and pancreatic cancer associated fibroblast population. And these two UMAP are the result, uh, which is essentially all that you need to understand for the pancreatic cancer part today. And uh, these are the cancer cells that can be categorized into about eight clusters across different pancreatic cancer patients. And these are the same fibroblasts that we can also find the recurring programs that can uh, classify the pancreatic calf into multiple subtypes. And because we have done this analysis, not only for single patient, but across about 20 patients, uh, what we can do is we can now look at uh, the single cell component uh, compositions for each patient and how this each single cell clusters of cancer cells and fibroblasts are contributing to each patient cancer. And for this left bar is the epithelial cell composition. And then this panel shows the fibrous text and composition. And these are the patient sample metadata uh, showing their relation with the stage information or mutation information. And one thing you can easily notice is that these three patients are the samples that has been taken from the pre-malignant region, which is quite uniform. They have a uniform cluster of one single epithelium and quite dominated by the single fibrous type. And as they enter the malignant phase, you can see that their diversity kind of really gets diversified. So that you can see uh, a lot of different epithelial clusters and fibrous clusters that are coming out. So what are these clusters and what are their characteristics? So let me guide you through the data. So firstly, uh, we have a normal-like cluster, both for the epithelial cells and fibroblast, uh, these two green ones and uh, the bluish ones are the normal like epithelium and fibroblast. And then as uh, as you look into the pre malignancy region, then you can see the single epithelial cluster and fibroblast cluster that are dominating this pre malignancy state. And as you uh, enter the malignant state, then you can now see uh, multiple different types of epithelial cells. And in pancreatic cancer, it is well known that uh, transcriptomically, the cancer can be uh, classified into the classical type and basal type. And basal type is usually associated with a bad prognosis. And what we could see is that this single cluster is responsible for the classical type uh, of the phenotype. And then this cluster, which shows a lot of EMT related genes and uh, showing the classical basal markers uh, is responding, uh, is uh, well corresponding to the, the basal classification. And what we could also notice is that uh, there are additional interesting cluster which occupies the transitional state between this uh, well-known classical and basal uh, signature. And uh, from the TCJ uh, data reanalysis, we could also notice that actually this transitional cluster is already associated with the bad prognosis. 
And this can be better shown in this uh, panel, which uh, we are showing that this uh, basal type signature and the transgenic type signature are both showing associated with a bad prognosis in both TCGA and uh, Parker data set. Uh, but interestingly, uh, this basal signature is well correlated with the EMT score, whereas this transitional status uh, is still uh, is yet to be associated with the EMT signature. So it's uh, showing some some sort of intermediate phenotype between the classical epithelial cells and basal cells. And then we could also identify the transcription factors that uh, should be uh, responsible for this transition from the critical to basal type of the pancreatic cancer. And what was interesting is this could be actually replicate, uh, re uh, recapitulated in, in vitro analysis, where we uh, reanalyze the baroclinistic data uh, for when uh, the chemotherapy has been treated uh, to the pancreatic cancer uh, steroid. Then what, it, what is known is that the classical signature goes down upon the chemotherapy and the basal uh, signature goes up. But what we could also find is uh, this transitional signature that we have identified actually surge during the, this transition process and then uh, goes down again. So this kind of uh, proved that this transitional status can be also uh, repeculated and recalculated in in vitro dynamics. And another thing is we could find a uh, very interesting uh, cuff diversity, which include, uh, include the classical ECM in each, like myo cuff or desmoplastic cuff like phenotype. And then here we could also see the immune related or inflammatory cuff. And then we could also find a really pancreatic cancer specific cuff, which we named as a deserted cuff. And the reason for that, uh, we named this cuff as a deserted cuff comes later with the spatial analysis where we actually perform the BGM, the classical type of the spatial transcriptomics approach uh, for the patients that we have profiled with the single cell level. And when we uh, deconverted this spatial data with our single cell profile, what we could observe is that interestingly, the transition that we postulated from the transcriptom level, transitioning from the epithelial classical epithelium through the transitional and basal epithelium. This transition can be also seen at the spatial level where you can see this classical epithelial cells dominating in this area. Then you can see the enrichment of greenish transitional sort of status, which terminates in the uh, purplish uh, basal state. So one conclusion from this spatial analysis is that this uh, evolution pathway that has been postulated from the transcriptome analysis can be validated also in the spatial analysis. Uh, this graph is basically the summary of the spatial relationship, so neighborhood relationship. And then we could also see uh, the spatial relationship between, between the fibroblast and cancer. For example, the desmoplastic fibroblast, the desmoplastic cuff, is equally associated with all the cancer subtypes, whereas the Im immune or inflammatory cuff is uh, spatially localized with the endothelial cells and immune cells, but strictly uh, separated from the cancer area. So this nicely shows that why pancreatic cancer is called as a desmoplastic cancer and why the, it is difficult to treat with the immunotherapy. And then the deserted cuff that we only find in the pancreatic cancer is, as you can see here, here, the spatially isolated from all the other niches. So that, that's the reason why we call this as a deserted cut. And if you look at this one example, then you can actually question why the for the pancreatic cancer, the immune part and the cancer part is uh, like distinct, distinctly localized like this. And what are other what about other cancers? If you look at other cancers, example, can you see the these two ecosystems being mixed with each other, and what are the drivers for that? So that course for this kind of analysis, like uh, looking at the pan-cancer level, uh, what are the cellular ecosystem part, uh, components, and then how they are spatially localized. So to answer that question, uh, we have collected uh, a lot of public data, which uh, we only focus on the single platform 10x uh, genomics uh, to minimize the batch effect. And then we only focus on the unsorted samples, which uh, we can sample all the uh, part for constituting the tissue ecosystem. And then we collected not only tumor, but also the healthy normal and matching adjacent normal sample. And this red bar and green bars are showing number of samples that we have collected for each of the cancer type. So this encompasses now about uh, 1,500 uh, patient sample data 
across thirty cancer types. And when we integrate all this data into the same space, then we can see uh, the, the geometry like this, where we can find the diversity of the cancer epithelium and mesenchyme and T cell, B cell, and myeloid cells. And you can see where they are coming from and whether they are coming from normal tissue and tumor tissue. And just from this, what we can do is we can define the cancer microenvironment hallmark. So which genes are uh, exemplifying uh, the cancer status for each cell type. So for example, CDAT cells, what we can see is that across different organ type, CD27, TG, CTL4, or 6 a 13 well-known cancer-associated CDAT cell markers are also well shown in our analysis. But we can also see that for the pancreatic cancer, uh, the level of the CD CXA13 or PD1 level is comparably lower than other cancer type, which already show the peculiarity of the pancreatic cancer. And then we can also do this analysis for all the other cell types, uh, potentially uh, giving us an idea of uh, what can be, uh, what can be act as a potential target for the cancer therapeutics. And then another idea that we strike us after doing this analysis it, is that maybe we can use this analysis to uh, pinpoint the cancer specific markers for example car t therapy which is uh the which is adopting the t cell uh, the cytotoxic t cell so that they can uh their tcrs has been re-engineered so that they can uh, specifically mark and kill the cancer cells and this car t therapy has been well applied to uh the hematoma uh, hemo hemorrhagic malignancies like B-cell malignancies, where we can find very good markers like CD19. But for the solid cancer, uh, it is difficult to identify specific markers. And then there's also worry about the side potential side effect when you have when you don't have a unique marker. And also the tissue migration is not easy. So uh, the CAR T for solid cancer is still uh, still in the their preliminary, preliminary status. And with this data, what we have thought is maybe we can design the systematic pipeline to come up with the cancer-specific markers by comparing the tumor and normal cell address. And then what we have realized is that for solid cancers, we cannot uh, find any one specific marker that is specifically marking the cancer cell. So instead, we took this combinatorial marking approach where uh, we find other uh, either and gate markers or or gate markers or not gate markers, which is the logical gating between two gene combinations. So, and then we test which combination is maximizing the tumor cell coverage while minimizing the normal cell coverage. And uh, to cut long story short, uh, we could apply the machine learning technique to identify these combinatorial markers uh, where, for example, for good sort of combinations, uh, we can see the good cancer coverage, which is shown as a long bar here, but very low normal cell coverage. And this uh, combinatorial markers usually works much better than the single markers that has been previously suggested for the CAR T therapy. So we can, uh, we we hope that this kind of a marker finding approach can be universally applied for not only for the CAR T targets but for any other type of the uh, like specific cancer targeting approaches. And another beauty of this approach is that then we can also now quantitatively predict the potential of targets uh, by quantifying for this each of the marker combination, which normal cells they're having the most coverage on. And by assessing this uh, uh, cell list, we can uh, sort of prioritize which markers would have a minimal side effect. And then another uh, Another approach, that we, uh, another sort of application that we try to utilize our cancer cell address is to try to deeply understand the cancer microenvironment. But for that, we realized that our UMAP is not still quite satisfy satisfactory because uh, while we are integrating this amount of the enormous data set, there are a lot of batch effects coming from diverse direction. Uh, so the, instead, the approach that we thought is Maybe uh, not starting from the unsupervised data analysis. Maybe we can just focus on the uh, well-known factors, well-known sort of gene programs that defines the cellular uh, cellular phenotype. And then we actually wanted to identify these gene programs in unbiased manner. And 
the, the, where, uh, the most popular approach that are being used in single cell fields these days uh, for identifying gene programs are non-negative matrix spectralization or NMF, which is decomposing the cell, uh, cell by gene, gene expression matrix uh, with the, with the non-negative combination of the loadings and gene programs. And what we did uh, is we ran this NMF for the cell types that we have roughly annotated. So we have run NMF per cell type, and we have run it per sample. This kind of minimized the batch effect because now these factors only focus on the, on the variables that are found within batch. And then we also ran NMF scanning by, by, by scanning multiple K parameters, the parameter for factorization. And then after that, what we have is for each cell type, we have a N sample by, uh, multiplied by number of M parameter factors, which are quite a lot of number of factors. Uh, and to summarize this, we utilize the approach to considering this each factors as a cells. And then we projected these factors onto the UMAP space. So now UMAP space shown here, is not a cell space. This is actually uh, the cell program or NMF vector space where we can visualize this, uh, the fact, not only visualize the cell vectors, but actually assess their characteristics to systematically find the potential sort of contaminants or artifacts and only uh, leave out the meaningful gene programs that is, uh, that is summarizing the, uh, the actual biologically important variables. So the process looks like this. We first generated uh, the entire NMF module UMAP, and then we filter out the mitochondria or ribosome gene clusters and all the others, some sort of uh, like so-called boring clusters. And after that, we systematically rule out the soup contamination, which is caused by the ambient RNA contamination from the single cell data, and then come up with the final UMAP, uh, NMF module UMAP and NMF crest clusters. And by calculating the centroid of these NMF clusters, uh, we could utilize those features to deconvolute, for example, spatial transcriptomics data. And also we can actually use those components for the reference component analysis to project the cells onto the space. And then we can also use, use to deconvolute the ball currency to do the survival analysis, and then assess the cell status uh, heterogeneity across organs and then also assess the coincidence between the programs across multiple samples. So that's what we have done for our, our analysis. And today I'm just gonna give you an example for the mesenchymal cells. So these are the NMF modules UMAP space for the mesenchymal factors that we have identified and annotated in this manner. And for these clusters, we can find the modules and their specific and also gonna mark our gene sets. And utilizing this as a reference component, we can actually remap our cells back onto this reference component space. And after that, what we can do is we can actually now link with this, each of this, this gene program with the cell counterpart that is responsible for those phenotypes. And finally, we could have uh, this kind of the mesenchymal programs and mesenchymal cell types uh, that can be identified across the cancer and normal tissue. And then for those programs, we can ask the systematic questions, for example, which one is enriched in cancer? So these ones uh, shown, in the, shown in the top are the ones that are enriched in the tumor tissue, whereas the red ones are the ones that are enriched in the normal tissue. And then, uh, for example, we can also assess their gene expression pro uh, profiles. And interestingly, for this, both inflammatory fibrous programs that shares the same chemokine uh, sort of signatures, we can see two different uh, sort of subtypes. One is more niched in normal cells. The other, wind 5 positive one, is more niched in the cancer cells. And then we can also ask, which cancers uh, can we find this wind 5 a positive cancer-specific fibrous? And then we can note that these are specifically niched in skin or head and neck or gastrointestinal uh, tumors, whereas the normal inflammatory programs are usually found in breast, ovary, or uterus. And for this uh, wind 5 a cancer-specific inflammatory cuff, we can see that they are associated with the shorter survivors, so bad prognosis. And again, by deconvoluting the 
spatial genomic, uh, spatial transcriptomics data, we can actually see that uh, this inflammatory fiber rust is not actually localizing with uh, canonical inflammation signatures like neutrophils, but actually they co-localize with the desmoplastic fiber rust in these kind of cancers. So we are now considering the possibility that this can be a sort of the reactive program Uh, uh, that is uh, with this disease. So what we can do with this kind of program is that we can ask which states are co-occurring across the tissue types. For example, for T-cell states and myeloid states, uh, which programs occur? Interesting thing, the thing that you can notice is that in the normal and tumor programs, so that these interactions between interferon and other immune signatures are only specifically found in tumor tissue, but not uh, much in normal tissue. And this can be also abstracted into the neighborhood graph in, in the form like this. And what you can see is that the interferon responsive program that is only found in tumor, uh, tumor tissue forms this kind of network, whereas they are dispersed in our normal cell, uh, ecosystem, normal tissue ecosystem. And interestingly, when we took out all this program, all this uh, single cell defined program, and then we utilize them to deconvolute the bulk, da bulk RNA-seq data that has information about their therapy response to the immune checkpoint therapy, we can see that all these programs that we defined here um, showing a good predictive power for the response to the immunotherapy. Uh, and then another interesting thing is that we could actually find uh, the multiple component of the tertiary input structure that is uh, recently shown to be exist in the cancer tissue, forming an adaptive immune response program within cancer. And this has been related uh, with the uh, response to the immune checkpoint therapy. So then we next questioned whether uh, this TRS is responsible for, solely responsible for the predicting the response to the immunotherapy. So what we did, we have collected about 150 Bezium data across multiple cancer types. And among this visium data, we noticed that there are some samples that already the pathologist has defined the TRS local, uh, location within the HNE &E image. And then what we could do is we can um, actually score our G specific uh, single cell programs uh, within this TRS spot and, with, uh, and then outside from this TRS spot. And we can uh, then pinpoint the program that is really sp spatially specific to TRS structure and some other programs that are exist uh, within and with uh, and the external from this TRS structure. And then uh, among the interferon responsive programs that we have identified, uh, which shows our uh, which has a uh, our good pro uh, sort of predictive value for the immunotherapy, we can find that almost half is localized in TRS, but another half is localized actually outside of the TRS, which means that TRS program is not just the sufficient for the immunotherapy response uh, prediction, but the interferon response program as a whole is responsible for that. So just to summarize, so in this uh, in this uh, research, we have constructed the pancreas single cell atlas, and by annotating the NMF modules, we have generated about hundred filters to understand tumor across uh, ecosystem by doing mostly deconversion analysis on the spatial data and large core bulk RNA-seq data set, and we believe that this can be utilized as a good. Uh, good sort of features to understand uh, the cancer ec ec ecosystem in the further, further studies. And if I, I, I don't think I have a, a, lot of, a lot of time remaining, so I'll stop my talk here and I just acknowledge uh, so, some collaborators, uh, especially Che Jung Yun Che and He Yong and He Jung An, and uh, for the cancer cell atlas uh, projects, and uh, Bang Sing -min, uh, Professor Sing Min Bang and Ingram from Yonsei University, who has worked together on the pancreatic cancer project. And if you have any questions, uh, please provide onto the chat. Uh, so I can see. Okay, the question is. Uh, while distinguishing cough by their lowers, immune and cancer-related coughs, weren't there any uh, behaving as both lowers? Uh, and uh, how did you rule out the possibility that if it were to have a double-like patterns? So firstly, 
Uh, so we do believe that the, there are cups that is serving an immune role in cancer. As actually the uh, there are another cup that I didn't mention today, including CCL19 positive one and interferon responding one that are also quite niched in the cancer microenvironment and that are also predicting the good response to the immunotherapy. So there are actually many different types of cuff and among them, the wind fiber inflammatory cuff that we have identified, I think they are more likely to have a sort of a growth factor related uh, function or stem cell related function rather than the inflammatory function in cancer context. And uh, the, how to rule out the doublet like patterns, I think it's a, it's a difficult uh, actual task that we need to carefully handle for this integrative data analysis. And for us, what we have done, we have done a lot of subsetting approaches. Uh, so we, we actually used like the scrublet or any other like doublet detecting sort of algorithms, but we found that they are usually not enough. So what we have done is we subset it into the individual clusters and we assess uh, the possibility of existing doublets by assessing their sort of proportions and uh, unique markers uh, can they have. So that's 